everyone. Thanks for being here and welcome to our next MCATS seminar hosted by the Topos Institute. So thanks to everyone at the Topos Institute and thanks to Tim for doing our technical things today. Uh, so our speaker today is Jennifer Brown from UC Davis and she's gonna talk about scale categories and quantization. And just a couple of reminders about how we do questions. Please, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat just to me, Eugenia Chen, and then I will convey them at various moments. So if you have a question to clarify something that's been in the slides, then we'll do that at the end of each section. So I'll pause to ask the speaker uh, to see, the speaker will pause to ask if there are any clarifying questions, then I'll convey those. And then anything that's more general, uh, I will convey at the end. And then afterwards, we'll have a, we'll then revert to a kind of chat time. So there's a bit of time to just for everyone to say hello and socialize a bit. And at that point, we maybe won't have the speakers off the hook and we won't have more mathematical questions. We'll just have social time or something like that. Okay, great. So without further ado, thanks very much. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for letting me come and especially for uh, Eugenia for meeting occasionally over the last couple of months to talk about this. All right. So today, uh, as I said, I want to talk about skin categories and quantization. Um, and so how I want this to go is first, I want to say, what do I mean by quantization? What does this look like? Uh, then I want to talk about the scheme categories that are going to show up. And then finally, I want to introduce, introduce uh, an invariant called the A polynomial, which is the thing I'm trying to quantize. Okay. So first off, what's quantization? Uh, so the term quantization comes actually from physics. And in physics, what it's describing is the process of starting with some classical system and then describing the corresponding quantum version of that system. And uh, under this sort of translation, observables, so things like position, momentum, et cetera, go from being functions to being operators. So we have this transition from functions to operators. Now, mathematically building on this, quantization is this process of starting with some commutative algebra and then building from it a non-commutative version. So for example, uh, let's say we start with polynomials and two variables. And from this, maybe we would quantize the differential operators. So this would be perhaps with coefficients, Laurent polynomials in one parameter. So multiplication by x and partial differentiation by x. And uh, these don't commute because of the product rule. Uh, so this is our non-commutative version. So sort of the squiggly line here, what it could mean is x goes to multiplication by x, y goes to this differential operator. But uh, for some general polynomial f, the right quantization may not be clear. So for example, here, x times y equals y times x. But if I just plug in this map to each of them, I'm going to get different operators. So this is kind of uh, a tricky point in quantization. So I want to say what and why we're quantizing today. So today, we're interested in quantizing a certain not invariant, uh, which is called capital A. It's a polynomial in two variables, and it's called the A polynomial. A stands for affine. Uh, so in its quantization, is going to be a Q difference operator, uh, which I'm going to be calling AQ of L and M. And these operators, L and M, are going to be acting on functions with integer coefficients valued in Laurent polynomials. And it's going to go as follows. So we're going to have a shift operator. So L of n, um, L of f of n is f n plus 1. And then we're going to have a multiplication operator. So m f of n is just going to be pre-multiplied by q to the n. OK, so our motivation for doing this is the AJ conjecture, which predicts that for any knot, the quantum version of this A polynomial, uh, if you apply it to the color Jones polynomial, you get 0. Conjecture is a little stronger than that. This is kind of how it boils down, and this is where it gets its name, AJ. So my work in this is to give some robust, computable construction of this quantization AQ, such that I have this parameter Q, if I send it to 1, I recover the A polynomial. And then also, for sort of more theoretical reasons, it would be reasonable to expect this star condition to hold. So I'm going to do this using skein categories. Are there any general questions about this so far?
Okay, for that, let's talk about scheme categories. So uh, talking about scheme categories, the first thing I want to introduce is these things called ribbon categories. So a ribbon category, I'm going to be throughout the talk, this kind of fancy A will be a ribbon category. So it has a monoidal structure, some tensor product, which is a functor from Cartesian product of the category back to itself, and then some monoidal uh, element, some unidal element. And then on top of that, it has braiding, which is a family of isomorphisms. So for each pair of objects in my category, it's an isomorphism from V tensor W to W tensor V, and it needs to satisfy um, this commutative diagram. So uh, this diagram is saying on the top, if I braid on the left, right, left, it's the same as going right, left, right. Uh, and this, you may have seen it before, it's the Yang-Baxter equation. So we have that, and then we also have duality. So we need two morphisms uh, for each object. One of them is going to be co-evaluation. It goes from the unit to V tensor its dual. And the other one is going to be evaluation. So it goes from V dual tensor V back to the unit. And these also have some conditions on them. Uh, the one I want to talk about is that if we start with our object V, and then I do the co-evaluation on one side, then the evaluation, I should get back just to V. So this should just be the identity map. And then similarly, if I start with V dual, and I do my co-evaluation, then my evaluation, I'll get back to the dual. So kind of the, I think the first and nicest example of a ribbon category is the category of ribbons. So uh, this category, the objects, you can think of a set of objects as just signed uh, non-negative non uh, numbers. Uh, and I often think of these as like actually points in space. So for instance, uh, one, it's minus, or I could have two points, a positive and negative, and I can have an empty set. Uh, and morphisms in this category are going to be ribbon graphs, which is another name for framed tangles. So for instance, this thing I have drawn here is a map from just one point, negative, to negative, negative, plus. Uh, and these uh, tangles are going to be directed, and the direction has to agree with these signs. And they're also framed. That won't come up for us very much. Okay, so the monoidal structure here is going to be disjoint union. So the tensor of uh, this morphism and this morphism is just I put them next to each other. It's juxtaposition. Uh, my braiding is going to be crossing. So C of two points is going to be this overhand crossing. Uh, it's an isomorphism. Its inverse is going to be the crossing in the other direction. So here, uh, this big commutative diagram that we have, if we draw it in terms of these crossings, uh, we get that this diagram on this side, which is the upper path, equals this diagram, which is the lower path. And if you stare at this for a moment, you can see sort of topologically what's going on here is this thread and very back, which I drew in green, is happening ab above this crossing, and then here it's below this crossing. So this is Reitermeister 3, if you've seen this move. Okay, and finally, duality here is going to be given by these uh, little tangles called cups and caps. So the co-evaluation is going to be the map from no points, which is my unit, to two points up here. And then conversely, evaluation is two points, and it goes to none. And again, we see that these commutative diagrams have nice topological images. So this is the diagram on the left, right? If I do uh, co-evaluation, then evaluation, it's the same as identity. And then uh, conversely on the other side. So you can see this is saying we can just straighten out these curves. All right. So I want to say, how do we get from these ribbons to skeins? So the way that we start with this ribbon category and then get some skein categories is first what we want to do is work with some enrichment, which is a category of colored ribbons. So this is ribbons before. You can have coefficients A, which is just some other ribbon category. And now objects uh, are still going to be these collection of points, but they can be labeled with objects from A. And these uh, labels are often called colors. I'll say that out loud a lot. 
So anamorphisms are as before, they're going to be these framed tangles, but now they have to respect the colors. So say here and back, you can see there's this sort of, it would be the identity map, it's going behind, and it has to go from W to W. Um, so we have that. Uh, and then also we can add these things called coupons. So if F is a morphism in my original ribbon category, uh, I can just stick it in to one of these tangles. Okay, so given this whole thing, uh, sort of an important fact is that there's a unique braided monoidal functor from this colored ribbon category back to the coefficients. Uh, and this functor is sort of made unique by the fact that it sends uh, like a series of, of points, their colors to the corresponding tensor product. Yeah. So uh, this functor F induces gain relations. So if I look at the homomorphisms, my ribbon category between two objects, right? I can have two tangles in here. So T1 maybe could look something like this. T2 is some other diagram. And I'm going to say that these two are equivalent if and only if they're sent to the same thing by this uh, functor F. So this is uh, going to be the basis of our scan relations. Okay. Now using this, we're going to make a scan category. So this is going to be denoted scan category coefficients in A, and it's going to be associated to a surface sigma. So first, let's talk about how it goes for a disk which I'm going to write throughout as blackboard bold D. So for a disk, the objects are going to look the same as in just the colored ribbon category. But now uh, what I want to think about it is these dots, instead of just floating in space like they are here, I'm going to think about them as being in a line in my disk like this. And so my morphisms now are going to be spanned by these ribbon graphs, F, uh, morphisms in the ribbon category that's colored. And then I'm also going to subject it to these ribbon, these gain relations. Okay. So this is just for a disk. For general surface sigma, our objects now are going to be still points, but they can just live anywhere in our surface sigma like this. Uh, and this is also sometimes people ask, it's not up to isotopy or anything. It's just they're really just fixed where they are. So anamorphisms are going to be spanned by ribbons in the thickened surface or surface time some interval. So there's room for graphs in it. And this, our skein relations are going to be applied locally. And what that means is that if I have any thickened disk living inside my thickened surface, I can uh, like apply this notion skein relation and I just any, everywhere I do that locally. So, uh, for instance, this is what reverse gain relation may look like, is that locally uh, this morphism is the same as the, the sum of these two. Okay, so let's talk about some properties of skein categories. I think one of the sort of nice first things is that this skein category construction is itself a functor. And it's a functor from the category I'm gonna call surf. These objects are surfaces and whose morphisms are embeddings of the surfaces. And it goes from there to the category I'm going to call cat, whose objects are just small uh, C joint Q linear categories, and then whose functors have to be C linear functors. So it's a functor. Um, and then also, sort of a fact that gets used a lot, and we'll be using later in this talk, is that this unique functor F is actually a categorical equivalence between the skein category of a disk and A. And that's just by construction, right? We, uh, the kernel of this map is the, exactly the skein relations, or the kernel of the, the map ribbons is exactly the skein relations. Um, in particular, that means the skein category of a disk is a monoidal structure. Topologically, the monoidal structure looks like this. So I have some object X, some object Y, and their tensor product it's going to be the disk where I've sort of smushed all of these points together. Uh, I want to say uh, for the disk, it's monoidal, but the skein category of an arbitrary surface is not monoidal in general. It's a pretty special property of the disk. Okay. 
And then finally, uh, something that's sort of, uh, I would say, computationally really important is that the scheme category construction satisfies excision, which means if there's some topological decomposition uh, and we push through this uh, construction, we get some categorical decomposition. So for instance, if our big surface sigma, I decompose it into say sigma one, sigma two, and glued along some thickened surface uh, C, then I'm gonna get the skein category of the whole thing is gonna decompose into the tensor product. So skein category sigma one, sigma two. Ah, oh, this should be sigma two. Sorry. And for some correct notion of uh, tensor product. So this is another uh, useful property of them. Okay. So, uh, so the next sort of important construction involved in these skein uh, categories is going to be skein modules. So first off, uh, we're going to have M. It's going to be any three manifold, and its boundary I'm going to call sigma, like this. And then X, let it be any object in the skein category of the, the surface. So remember, X is going to be some collection of points in our surface, like down here I have drawn. And then the relative skein module, which I'll call skein mod of X, or M comma X, is going to be, again, a vector space. And it's spanned by tangles in M in this whole manifold. And their boundary is going to be this uh, fixed object X. And again, modulus skein relations. So here's an example of some vector in this vector space. Uh, will be this orange curve I have drawn here. It's living in M. And its boundary has to be some fixed uh, X. So that's what that looks like. And then we can build this all together to get a functor. So this whole skin module, non-relative version, is going to be a functor. It's going to be the contravariant functor from the skin category of the surface to vect. So it's a pre-sheaf. Um, and on objects, it's just going to send an object X to the associated uh, relative skin module. And on morphisms, what it's going to do looks like the following. So say I have some morphism from y to x in the skein category of sigma. So that's going to look something like this, right? I have y and x, and I have some morphism going up. How is this going to act uh, on some object in the, um, the image of x under this functor? So I have the uh, image of x under the functor, sorry something in this relative skein module of X, and I can compose it with the image of this, uh, and I get the Y. So it's like sort of how my morphisms end up acting is there's gonna be this stacking to get the whole space. So that's how it, uh, the functor acts on morphisms. So this is like, this is the categorical image of what's going on, but for quantization, uh, what we really want is some way to describe algebras and their modules. Um, to connect sort of to the, the classic commutative cases we're trying to quantize. So in order to get these, we're going to need to use some category theory. So here's some category theory we'll be using. Um, well, first off, recall two functors. Here I'm going to call them uh, R and L. And they're going to be said to be a joint if there are some natural transformations. So I need a natural transformation, which is called the unit. I'm going to write it as eta, and it goes from the identity functor on D, one of my categories, to the composition RL. So that's one of my natural transformations. The other one is going to be the co-unit, uh, and it goes from LR up to the identity functor. So these need to satisfy some extra conditions, um, but this is, the, this is the initial data. So equivalently, and the way that I actually think about uh, adjoints most of the time as if I have homomorphisms and I have applied a left adjoint on the left side of the homomorphisms and this is naturally isomorphic to having applied the right adjoint on the right side of the homomorphisms. Um, so if, let's say we start with some functor L from D to C. Uh, it may not have a right adjoint but uh, if it's nice enough it will. Um, if it's co-continuous, sort of the important property that we'll run into. 
So if it's co-continuous, I'll have one. But if not, there's a co-continuous extinction that we can build, which I'll call L hat. And it goes from D hat, which is some category, to C hat. And this is the free co-completion. So the free co-completion of category C is going to be a functor from C to something called C hat, which is, by definition, contravariant functors from C to vector spaces. So this is uh, also sometimes called the pre-sheaf category. And how this acts on an element V, the original category, gets sent to V hat, which is just the functor uh, homomorphisms into V. So um, the fact that the free co-completion actually takes sends um, categories to locally presentable categories, and it sends functors on these categories, between these categories to co-continuous functors. Um, so this construction also has a universal property, which is that if I start with C, and I have a functor to any other co-complete category D, this functor is going to uniquely factor through the free co-completion. Most of the nice property of them. So uh, why do we want an adjoint uh, pair? It's because we can construct a monad from an adjoint pair. So a monad uh, is going to be some functor, C to C, and also needs the data of a natural transformation from uh, the identity functor to t, and then natural transformation from t squared to t. So this is called the unit and the product, um, in analogy with algebras, I think. So this needs to satisfy some punitive diagrams. So one of them is going to be uh, sort of applying the product on the, the right, and then multiplying the result, versus on the left, and then multiplying the result has to give me the same thing. So this is a, an associativity constraint. Uh, and the other requirement is going to be if I apply my unit on either side, so on the left or on the right, and then multiply. Uh, either way, this has to be the same as just um, doing the identity. So this is sort of the, the unit has to act like you would want something called the unit to act. So from an adjoint pair, uh, we can build the monad of an adjunction. So we have an adjunction. It's going to be R and L, two functors. We have a unit and a co-unit. These are natural transformations. And the monad is going to have T is going to be RL, composition of these functors. Uh, the unit of the monad is just going to be the unit of the adjunction. And the multiplication of the monad, what we're going to do is take two copies of T, right? And in the middle here, if we zoom in, you see we have L and R next to each other. And these we can apply our co-unit to. We eat them up, and we just get RL. So that's our co-unit. Um, sorry. So how are we going to use this uh, in our skein uh, situation? This is going to be to build internal skein algebras and modules. So how it works is that the embedding of any disk into our surface sigma produces a functor from the skein category for the disk uh, to the skein category of the surface. I'm going to call this functor act. Uh, and topologically, what this functor looks like is I have my, my disk here. And maybe I have some points in it, some object in this category. And I'm just going to embed it near the boundary of a surface sigma. And if sigma doesn't have a boundary, uh, there's a standard way of puncturing it. Uh, dealing with this. Okay, so I have this functor. I'm going to want to build a monad from it. So I'm going to take the free co-completion. So this goes co-completion skein category of the disk to the skein category of the surface. And it has a right adjoint, which I'm going to just call uh, act superscript r for right. And it goes in the other direction. So we can build, as I said, a monad from this action puncture and its right adjoint. And the idea behind this is that this monad uh, T that we build is going to respect the monoidal structure on A hat, um, which remember there's not going to be a monoidal structure on the skein category of the whole surface sigma. Uh, and it, but it's going to depend on sigma 
because it's this action going into this gain category of sigma, but it lives over a disk, so we can get some extra structure out over it. Uh, so we're going to build an algebra out of it. So the internal scan algebra, which I'm, I have written here in blue, scan algebra internal decorated with A of a surface sigma is going to be the image of this mono, monoid uh, on sort of the unit element of our category, which is going to look like uh, a disk with just no points in it, sort of the empty set. Uh, so we have this algebra, the internal scan module, which is going to be scan int m, the three manifold, is going to be the object in a hat, and it's going to be the object which represents the, this big functor. So the functor which is first used from inserting a disk, and then after that, the scan module functor to vect. So when I say represents a functor, what this means is that for any object uh, v in my original category a associated to a disk, uh, morphisms out of v into the scan module are going to be by definition uh, the same, this is going to be the same vector space as the scan module functor, uh, so the relative scan module, right, of m with boundary, uh, the same v embedded in our surface. So this is a lot to unpack. So let's draw, look at it right here. So here I have this act of v hat, and this uh, is going to look like I have some small disk I've embedded on my surface, and there is some object v of the disk here. And then the relative scan module is uh, spanned by scans in my three manifold with that boundary. So this right here, uh, pushing aside the free code completion for a second, is going to look like uh, these, sort of spanned by, by such things. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about the A polynomial, but first I want to see if there are questions. So that was a little fast. Uh, there don't appear to be <clears throat> any questions right now, but there is uh, just something from me actually, which is yeah. I was wondering if you would uh, just use the mouse pointer and not the spotlight. Oh, sure. The flashing is making me a little ill. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thanks for mentioning it. Yeah, I can just use the mouse pointer. Thanks. Yeah, of course. There are no questions. I guess I can talk about the A polynomial. All right. So uh, the A polynomial, which you may recall, is the thing that sort of motivated me to get into this. Is so the A polynomial is a knot invariant, and a knot invariant is some construction which starts with a knot, which is some copy of S one, the circle, which has been embedded into S three, the three sphere, and then it's a construction quickly arrow that gives us some more rigid data. So for example, it produces a number or a polynomial or a category. So for example, uh, if I have to start with the trefoil knot, uh, regardless of what sort of depiction I have of it, so these are both drawings of the same knot, it's been shifted around some. If I apply the construction, I should get the same polynomial like this. But if I start, say, with the figure eight knot, which is drawn here, apply the same construction, I would get some different polynomial. Uh, and this happens, this example happens to actually be the A polynomial. Cool. So ideally, uh, knot invariants are easier to work with than the original data of the knot, and or they're independently interesting. So the A polynomial is defined using algebraic geometry. It was originally used to study incompressional uh, surfaces and knots. I'm going to talk about the algebraic geometry that goes into it. So first, some algebraic geometry. Historically, this field concerns polynomials, I would say, in broad terms. Uh, and it's used to give geometric structures to families. So say a family of representations, the vector bundles to really produce some geometric space which represents these. Uh, the basic set in this is going to be an affine set 
just sort of the zero set of some polynomials. So some subset V and C to the N is called an affine set. If there exists some set of polynomials S, uh, such that V is exactly uh, those points, which uh, when you plug them into any of the polynomials in S, you get zero. So it's the combined zero sets of all these polynomials. So conversely, the polynomials which vanish on one of these sets V forms an ideal. So I'm going to call this I of V. So I of V, again, is just this, every polynomial uh, in C to the N, such that when I restrict it down to the space, I get identically zero. Um, and just some vocabulary, V is called an affine variety if this ideal is a prime ideal. I'm going to be using the word variety a lot. It, uh, so that's what that means. Okay, so a major idea is that uh, we're going to study spaces by looking at functions on them. So the coordinate ring, uh, which is O of V, is going to be the ring of regular functions from V down to C. Uh, so regular functions, meaning locally they look like polynomials. So the regular functions on all of C in is going to just be the polynomial ring in N variables. And if V is some subset of C to the N, the ring of regular functions on V is going to look like this polynomial ring mod out by the ideal I had defined over here. Um, so that, and then uh, a map between two varieties, say V1 to V2, is going to induce a map in the other direction between the coordinate rings, some V2 to V1. Uh, and so that when we have this map, we're going to get some action uh, coordinate ring of V2 on the coordinate one, ring of V1. And this action is exactly what's going to be quantized. These will be the rings that we're going to quantize. Now I want to say we'll be doing this for some like very specific varieties, V1 and V2, so I want to say what those are. So first, yeah, these are character varieties. So a character variety is a way to construct a variety from a general topological space. So let X be some topological space uh, with its fundamental group pi 1 of X. It's going to be finitely generated. I'm just going to call the generators uh, G1 through Gn. Uh, and then just recall SLN C is going to be the group of two by two matrices with determinant one. And we're going to have B be a fixed Borel subgroup. So for example, it could be the group of upper triangular matrices. And then the framed character variety of the space X is going to be the space of characters. So I'm going to call it CH of X. And again, it's just the character of every representation of the fundamental group into this Borel. So here, uh, the character of some representation, which is just the trace of the representation, so the map from by one to B, and then the trace of this. So example here, the trace of this matrix A plus C down into C. So this is gonna be identified with the point, uh, which is the, the image on the generators of the fundamental group. So that's how we get an actual vector, actual point in CN. Or again, these GI are the generators of the fundamental group. So these things can be pretty complicated, or like geometrically they can be pretty involved, but as an example, for the torus character variety is just C star across C star. So C with the origin removed twice. Um, and these two copies come from, if you just recall, fundamental group of the torus has two generators and they commute. So it's just as Z2. So this is a character variety. Um, we're going to be building it for special spaces to make the A polynomial of a knot. So the A polynomial of a knot K living in the three sphere is built like this. So first we take the knot complement, which is I take S3 and then I just remove my knot from it. This is going to be a three manifold and it's uh, going to have a torus boundary, right? Just I've removed some knot, right? And you could think there is some torus following around this knot in three space. So that's the boundary. Okay. And then the inclusion of the boundary of this knot complement is a torus back into the whole bulk 
is going to induce a map from character variety of the complement to the character variety of the torus. I'm going to call this the boundary map. So uh, to be a little explicit, the boundary map applied on the character chi is going to be the composition of first I have a fundamental group of T2, fundamental group of the not complement, right? This is the just induced from including the boundary into the whole thing. And then after that, I uh, act by the character. So, so I mentioned before, uh, this is going to induce an action. So it's going to induce an action of the regular functions on a uh, character variety of the torus, which is going to look like Laurent polynomials in two variables. And it's going to act on the coordinate ring for the not complement. Like that. And so, like a major fact here is that as module for the uh, coordinate ring associated with the torus, coordinate ring associated with the not complement is going to have this nice form. So, it's going to look like Laurent polynomials modded out by some uh, cyclic ideal. And here's how we get the A polynomial. So, up to normalization, the A polynomial of a not K is the generator A of this ideal. So it's coming from, um, yeah, from this action of the torus on the not complement. Cool. So that's the A polynomial of a not. So how do we quantize it? Basically, what happens is that skein categories quantize character varieties. Uh, so what this means is that if I look at the internal skein algebra associated with the surface sigma, the right coefficients. This is a quantum version of this character ring of the, or the, sorry, the ring of regular functions of the character variety. So how we're going to use this to quantize the A polynomial. So start, remember A is sitting in this coordinate ring associated with the torus, which is learnt polynomials. Quantization is going to give us uh, this gain algebra of the torus, which is going to look like uh, it's going to have two generators, L and M, and these are going to Q commute, meaning if I switch their order, I get a factor of Q. And this is where the quantum version of my polynomial is going to live. Um, so these things are called Q difference operators. Uh, okay. So how this goes is that the not complement is a three manifold, and so it defines a skein module. So I had this action of the torus acting on the not complement. And when I push it through the skein algebra uh, machinery, I'm going to get an action of the skein algebra of the torus on the skein module of the, the bulk is not complement. And then, uh, just as when we were defining the uh, original A polynomial, say that as a module for the skein algebra of the torus, uh, this skein module of the not complement is going to look like the original algebra mod some ideal. Uh, and it's going to have this form just being this algebra mod out the cyclic ideal and the generator of that ideal is where the A polynomial will live. Okay, so that's how the, the process goes. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, there, there is already a question which was actually a clarifying question about that part. So perhaps I'll uh, pose that question first and give everyone a chance to decide if they would like to ask some other questions. So the question was, and I think it was on the slide that was um, defining the A polynomial maybe, why is the ideal A always principal? Uh, okay, I think this is, um, because we've localized. Basically, I think it is that 
I'm trying to remember. So I remember two years ago freaking out about this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's learn polynomials in two variables, maybe a PID. Where you do in this world often have some like polynomial ring and then have to add the inverses to get a PID. Is sort of how it goes. Uh, I'll say if it's not a uh, cyclic though it's not the end of the world so for example you can do this construction for a link instead of a knot and then you're not going to get a cyclic ideal here and you just say the a polynomials plural are you know a set of generators of this mm -hmm. okay thanks uh, are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask are there any questions from the youtube Oh, here's a question. Um, is there a reason for choosing B and D for the dualization maps? I uh, mean the, I'm guessing they mean the caps and cups. Hmm. Yes. So I think, yeah, so I think if you, Sorry, I'm thinking to make sure I'm not lying, but it could be that this is the only valid choice, could be that what happens. So for instance, um, all of our morphisms, I'm thinking of them as going up like this. And so for co-evaluation, I need something that goes, um, I need a tangle that doesn't touch sort of the bottom half, right? and then has sort of two endpoints up here. So already a tangle that goes, you know, has nothing above and two, or nothing below and two above is um, quite a strong constraint. And then sort of the, the opposite picture for evaluation, right? It has to go from two points to none. Oh, so there's, a, there's a clarification that the, the, mm -hmm. they meant just for choosing that notation. Oh, B and D? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I saw it in a paper. I often write co, ev, and ev, mm -hmm. but um, I picked B and D because they're the only single letters I had seen used somewhere else. I don't think there's like a nice poetry behind those letters. Great. Are there any other questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker again. And um, thanks. Yeah. The, the next talk is at some point. It's when is the two weeks and a day, I do believe. Right. It's at a more, a more awkward time for people in Europe. Thursday the 28th, and it's midnight in some time zone. Um, I think I think in UTC it's midnight. Midnight in some time zone is a great yeah. um yeah. Is a great way to specify a talk time. Yeah definitely. Um, yes the details are on the website but I'm pretty sure it's midnight UTC. I think it is as well. Yes, yes. On the Thursday, which is why yes yeah, so it sounds like it's on a Thursday, but it's actually on a Wednesday for the speaker, I do believe. No, I think that'll be the other way around. That, yeah, what you said. Okay, good. <laughs> um, anyway, should we stop the recording and then yes, we can have great. we can have a chat?